What you're seeing is the view from a drone flying into an area protected by birds of prey that have been trained to attack them. Can technology and biology be brought together in harmony? Are the built and natural environments fundamentally opposed or can they be integrated for mutual benefit? We will explore these and other pressing questions in the upcoming lecture and we hope you will be able to join us. Salve! Benvenuti a tutti, welcome for the first Meet the Media Guru focus con la tachycardia because the technology are always the problem. I'm Maria Grazia Mattei, I'm president of the Meet Digital Culture Center. Thank you for to be, to be here. I would like to thank first all our European friend and partner. I know lots of them are connected, so uh, other American and Canadian friends are. Participants from more than 50 countries are joining us. The digital focus uh, is the perfect occasion to come and work together as a global community. So uh, let, me to, let me thank also to Fondazione Carlo to make uh, because uh, uh, Fondazione Calabria is uh, one of the most important philanthropic foundation uh, in the world uh, and uh, they help uh, meet uh, activity uh, makes it possible as uh, well as our partners like Intesa San Paolo, Artemi, the Fondazione Fiera Milano uh, and, and, so, and, and Giorgio Brown College also from Toronto. Uh, say hello to my friends. So now I, I, would like to, I would like to switch in Italiano because my English is not so very well at the moment. And I would like to, to, to thank thanks a lot William Meyers is with us on air. I would like just to share with you two things. Il primo è che questa prima edizione di, eh, di Meet, Meet Focus è un pilota, è un pilota, è una sperimentazione per noi, è una sperimentazione che vogliamo portare avanti fondamentalmente perché pensiamo che in questa fase dove finalmente abbiamo capito che la realtà fisica ma anche la realtà virtuale insieme possono costruire delle grandi occasioni di, di connessione, di lavoro, di contatto, di circolazione di idee, eh, sono, eh, rappresenta una grande opportunità per poter approcciare ed entrare nel futuro in una maniera più, uh, più ricca, più intensa e, e, mi, e, e dico una cosa sola, noi crediamo che sia importante ora noi, noi come MIT, ma non solo noi, tutti quanti, avere un'attenzione particolare per quello che deve essere la comunicazione, ma non la comunicazione in senso stretto e classico, l'esperienza digitale, quella che noi chiamiamo digital experience, e dobbiamo cercare il modo di trovare eh, modalità eh, a seconda dei progetti, perché effettivamente si creino in rete delle esperienze, dobbiamo portare in rete la nostra umanità, dobbiamo portare in rete l'emozione, dobbiamo essere connessi anche attraverso l'empatia. E non è un fatto semplice, molte industrie ci stanno provando e abbiamo però capito che in questo prossimo futuro che ci aspetta, questa relazione così forte con una dimensione che sembra solo virtuale e destinata solo a essere, come dire, un telefono un po' più evoluto, in realtà è una dimensione di pratica e di esperienza da non sottovalutare. Noi quindi con questo piccolo Meet Focus online e grazie alla collaborazione con William Myers che è uno dei più grandi esperti al mondo di biotecnologia eh, in relazione all'arte, al disegno, alla scienza, abbiamo cercato di cominciare a costruire un processo di lavoro tra vita reale e vita virtuale, cioè abbiamo creato questo primo appuntamento che è una tappa, una fase che vi vede 
tutti molto impegnati a, a darci un contributo insieme a Myers, porteremo a casa delle idee da strutturare su cui ancora lavorare per poi ritornare insieme quando il Meet sarà aperto nello spazio Meet di Milano a un, per un confronto diretto e reale. Noi creiamo, crediamo così veramente di poter costruire un processo veramente collaborativo con il supporto e l'aiuto di moltissime realtà anche internazionali. Prima di tutto per questo appuntamento con William Myers. Eh, daremo seguito ad altri incontri con questo tipo di piattaforma che abbiamo creato apposta grazie a un team che si è speso fino all'ultimo nanosecondo prima di iniziare, eh, che hanno trovato il modo di mettere insieme strumenti diversi perché abbiamo visto che non c'è una, uno strumento unico e, e totalmente adatto a sviluppare tutti i livelli di empatia, di emozione e anche di gusto e anche di stile che ci piacerebbe portare nel mondo virtuale. Quindi partiamo con questo pilota, costruiamo insieme un pensiero, ci aspettiamo da voi anche durante quest'ora un contributo diretto e raccogliamo per ritrovarci poi in autunno, presumibilmente a ottobre, dentro il MIT con un incontro reale e fisico con William Mayer. Quindi io adesso vi auguro buon lavoro e, e, e grazie, grazie veramente a tutti per essere qui con noi. Thank you for all. Bye. Grazie, uh, good afternoon. Uh, today we are going to experiment a new format for working together on the topic of nature plus technology. Uh, we have decided an experimental interface for working better together. Uh, our dashboard is divided in three parts. On the left, you have the video streaming, then you have Slido, and on the bottom right corner, you can find another video stream with, uh, with our live sketching. Mm, there is an artist, Marcello Petruzzi, who is working on live sketching for us. Um, we will ask you to interact with us in three ways on uh, Slido. You have a Q&A tab where you can uh, leave your open questions. And then we have a poll tab. Uh, now, for example, we have just launched a, a poll on what city are you following us from? And we got more than 160 answers. So we have people from uh, Milano, but also from Barcelona, Amsterdam, uh, Toronto, Urbino, uh, Poland, and so on. Uh, and then we have uh, a tab uh, that is uh, ideas. Uh, that um, is where we are collecting all the contributions we are getting from you, uh, because we have uh, launched a call for ideas, uh, how might we design a better post-pandemic world through art, design, and biotechnology tools. Uh, more than 100 people have already registered, have already registered as a discussant uh, to be inclu included in this process. And uh, in a few days, we got more than 30 uh, contributions from people. Uh, we'd like to thank all the first discussant. Uh, we will just show now a list with the name of the people who have, um, who have sent us their contributions. And uh, William Myers has already replied to them. And uh, so if you go on Slido, you can find also uh, the reply by by William Myers. Uh, by the way, we are not active only on Slido and on midcenter.it. Uh, we are also in a multi-stream uh, uh, way. Uh, so we are on different social networks. Right, Lorenza? That is a perfect occasion to come together as a global community, right? And we are currently live also on Meet's Facebook and YouTube pages. And we are working to a special satellite connection to the White House. Well, just kidding. Seriously, your thoughts, ideas, and notes are very much appreciated. And all throughout your, this talk, uh, please feel free to post. No shyness. And always add your name while posting on our Facebook and YouTube page. And please do not publish any derogatory remarks. And be kind. We all need that. <laughs> And talking of kindness, this is the time for me to introduce Mr. William Mayers. Starting from the recent global crisis, he's going to tackle some worldwide major issues in his upcoming lecture. William will share with us his thoughts on nature and tech. Some of them, talk, some, them some topics of, well, he's talking about in a few minutes, already generated quite thoughtful insights. Well, 
William Mayers is an exhibition curator, is a writer and teacher based in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. He's also the author of two widely acclaimed books about the intersection of art, design and science, biodesign and bioart. And well, he will talk to us about nature and tech, creativity and design after the pandemic. And well, William, our virtual stage is all yours. Thank you very much, Lorenza and Nicola and Maria for the generous introduction. It's excellent to be with you all, or at least as, um, as together as we can be at a time like this. I will now begin sharing my screen so you can see our presentation. And now you should see an introductory slide. Yes, it looks like everything is, is working. So in this first segment, we'll talk about a few different topics by way of me describing a few projects and ideas comparing things that have come in the past to what is happening now. That will be about 15 minutes. We'll have time for some questions. And then a second part, we'll venture a little bit further from uh, design and nature and go into how we're starting to work with machines, um, machine learning systems, and what that means for creativity and um, uh, a number of different practices in the arts. So to begin with definitions, um, based on my, my research, the books that I've written and uh, uh, shows that I've helped organize, I think it's useful to point out biodesign is a practice in which one makes something either with, for, or about biology. To clarify, something that is with biology would be an example of taking a biological process or material and creating with it so in collaboration or by extraction, and this is often the case that it's replacing some earlier way of designing or making that relied on mechanical means or fossil fuels. For biology means making something that is helping to build a bridge and helping to, uh, for other non-human species to flourish. So if you design something like a, um, a mechanism for corals to help grow in, in the ocean or um, plants or other kinds of um, animals, that would be for biology. And about biology is the category that includes all of those projects that are speculative or in some way creatively imagine where the world is going with the advance of biotechnology. What that means is that you know, something that we need to question ethically and who is controlling these um, these kinds of experiments in this technology that's making all these changes. Now, before jumping into some familiar examples and, and also helping to explain that, that clip that you saw with the eagle and the drone, I think it's a good moment to stop and to say it's never good to waste a crisis, that what we're going through is all collectively quite difficult and varied across, um, across countries, across economic lines, education um, levels, I think it's a great moment to say how we've designed our public spaces, how things have been, how for so long, things like our cities are designed in such a way that serve very few, that we have an opportunity to reconsider how we use our spaces for things like cars and um, spaces for bicycles, it doesn't have to be expensive. What we're seeing already in people's ingenuity is that they will take will take tape or and spray paint and make very simple signs um, to redirect and to discover new ways that people can be organized in space safely. 
So on this note, I just um, urge you all to have a look at um, this article published in New York Magazine just two days ago, by an excellent writer, Justin Davidson, that digs into um, some of the possibilities for changing major cities like Milan or like New York, um, which I think we should all take a moment to consider. The video that you saw is prompted by uh, a new service that's available from uh, a company in the Netherlands, in The Hague, called Guard From Above. They train birds of prey to treat drones that you see here in this picture as they would food. And this is, I think, quite a fascinating encapsulation of designing with biology to making a security solution in a very novel way. And it is a great way to sidestep what often is the case when we seek technological solutions, which is to make something more advanced, to make something digital, to make something very complex and expensive and generally unsustainable. Like with the, uh, the problem with drones, maybe encroaching into where airplanes land or where dangerous materials are handled, all kinds of solutions were considered like using lasers or nets or other things like um, electromagnetic pulses. But similar to how you can um, train dogs to sniff out explosives and, and drugs, you can train birds to do what other machinery could otherwise like be very difficult for it to do. And this kind of approach is thinking about what partnerships can be made with the, the living world to solve contemporary problems goes way back to thousands of years of history of humans working with yeast, for example, to make wine, to make bread. This was my entry point into considering how the biosphere is just bursting with these opportunities to change technology, to, to remake how we make things so that we're more in partnership with the living world than opposed to it or controlling it or containing it. And then just going back a few hundred years ago, this kind of thinking was applied to fields such as architecture. What you're looking at is a root bridge in an area called Meghalaya in uh, northeastern India. This is one of the wettest places in the world. They have over um, 1,200 centimeters of rain a year. And without access to the knowledge and technologies um, for a long time that we take for granted in the West, this solution of guiding the growth of the roots of rubber trees made for a mobility solution to cross rivers. And it's a kind of architecture where you can imagine those that design it have to alleviate some control. They have to allow the trees to do what they want. And as you, even as you use it, it's never finished. It keeps growing and it's strengthened or changed by the patterns of use. In a more contemporary example that's closer to home for many of you, uh, based in Milan, is the, the work of Stefano Bri, the Basco Verticale, among other projects that work very successfully to insert more biological systems and, and material or sort of ecosystem foundations into an urban setting that is otherwise pretty barren. And this approach, while expensive to begin with, has gotten less expensive, has proliferated. There are projects to introduce more trees and bushes into urban spaces like this um, happening in, um, in China and in elsewhere. Going some steps further, this kind of imaginative vision from uh, Mitch Joachim and Terraform One of how more literally the built environment and the natural ecosystems can be sort of in communication with each other and you know, having energy and material flows um, happen between them in a greater harmony. This kind of idealized vision um, imagines that we would grow houses over 10 or more years and inhabit them in a very low density kind of environment. And I like to point out that this kind of approach, while maybe becoming more popularized and maybe recognized for its benefits, its meaning, its symbolism, is still held back in some ways by the legacy of the aesthetics of modernism. The buildings like this, the Seagram building in, in uh, New York City, um, from uh, 1958 by Mies van der Rohe. It's thought by many to be the epitome of um, the aesthetic, this embrace of the machine, the precision and the, um, 
the cleanliness, the control, the exactness of making such a, a, a structure and banishing from it any ornament. At least that's the sort of proposition. But in reality, you know, work like this has several contradictions. The facade itself is actually made of bronze. And those I-beams that are attached to, to the front of the building are um, really not functional at all. But they're, they're helping to express the inner working or the um, inner structure of, of the building itself. And I would say that we probably jumped onto this um, largely in the uh, you know, mid 20th century. And it was so appealing in ways which we didn't quite recognize and understand because of the long legacy of suffering from disease and death at the hands of biology. What you're seeing now is a picture of patients suffering from the Spanish flu at the Brooklyn Navy Yard in 1918. eerily similar to some of the images that we have seen in the last weeks. And of course, that, that event, which probably many of you have read about recently, a um, hundred years ago, claimed the lives of uh, 50 million or more people, something like 2% of the world population at the time, although estimations vary. We have since then gotten a handle on a lot of disease and um, a lot of um, the kinds of problems that would lead to pandemics, the situations that would lead to pandemics. But of course, it goes without saying that we're not immune. But what is interesting is to note the scale of things, how in such a short amount of time, things have changed so much. And a lot of people um, don't recognize that we had a germ theory of disease that was only recognized and widely adopted in the early 20th century. And then it took another three or so decades for us to have reliable antibiotics and other medicines that would address a lot of what in the past had been um, uh, plagues. And just another more contemporary look at proportionally um, how pandemics in their total numbers of lives claimed um, look at the moment, recognizing that this is all in motion in terms of the latest pandemic. But it points to the possibility that like in the mid 20th century, the conditions today might lead to a uh, kind of step backward towards over sanitizing and over controlling spaces to our overall detriment, not just environmentally speaking, but to human health. As some of you might know, the behavior of over cleaning or over sanitizing and disinfecting spaces helps give rise to um, more deadly uh, pathogens and um, microorganisms that that can hurt us. What had been helping to change these perceptions, I think, and I think what still has a way to go in the science, but is at least entering the popular imagination in terms of how we think about ourselves and how we think about the spaces around us, is study of the human microbiome. This is the, the very complex and um, numerous uh, ecosystem that lives inside and on our bodies. What you're seeing here is just a glimpse of all the complexity of the skin microbiome. Never mind all that lives inside your body and in the um, other parts of the kind of like small cracks and crevices all over you. It's found that these are actually essential to normal human health, the maintenance of our immune systems, digestion, and even our mental health. And there are organizations looking into this to try to study and understand not just how it works with our bodies, but how it works in our spaces. So at the Center for the Biology and the Built Environment, they're, they're mapping out how in different places, whether it's an office, a shop, um, public transit, the air and the surfaces give rise to different kinds of life, different sorts of um, microorganisms that like to live there. The thinking being that if that can be mapped and well understood in terms of conditions like lighting and humidity and materials, what we could eventually do is create a design approach to making interior spaces and even you know, outwardly facing architecture that is probiotic or is mindful of the health impacts, the potential health impacts of making spaces a particular way. And there's some science to support this, although it's not conclusive yet, but that one, one has a very varied and healthy 
microbiome personally, they're more resistant to viruses and other um, uh, organisms or microorganisms that um, could lead to disease. If this, if this fascinates you, if you'd like to go on a journey of understanding how these kinds of um, organisms work and how they work together with other species, not just humans, within the ecosystems are all around us in very surprising um, intricacies. I recommend this book by Ed Young. It profiles many examples of how already we are, we're an interconnected community um, at the macro scale as well as the micro scale. And the better that we understand how things work in our body and among the kinds of life that are invisible to us, I think the more opportunity there is to change fields like design for the better. Now, some of these, this is kind of a, um, kind of a brief look at a number of different ideas and projects for a, going deeper into all, all of them. I'd recommend having a look at this uh, on my website. I've um, put out references for all the different slides in the um, presentation. And I thank you for your attention. This is the kind of first end of the first part, and we'll have a little bit of time for questions. a lot of uh, inspirational works and visions of the future and uh, on Slido we are getting a lot of feedback from our discussant. We have also a poll live now where we are asking people to write down um, the title or of um, disruptive biodesign projects and we have uh, people suggesting uh, um, Neri Oxman and Silk Pavilion or Flora Robotica Hong Kong Honey. We are going to collect all this feedback in the final report of this event. And by the way, a big issue, uh, a lot of people are discussing about the role of designer and artists in the post-pandemic world. There is the optimistic view saying that uh, designers and artists, they already have an holistic approach. They can manage different skills and disciplines. So they are the perfect researcher for the new for the new century. But we had also a provoking idea from uh, Silvia Albertini. Uh, she was suggesting us uh, that in a world where uh, uh, everything is becoming dema dematerialized, uh, there is the new paradigm of uh, bionism, that is the intersection of uh, technology and biology on the human body. Uh, so in such a world, who will be the designer? Our doctor, our personal coach? What do you think, William? That's a great question. I think it it's inevitable that we will modify our own bodies in ways that will seem strange. Like in 20 years, 20 years from now will seem strange um, from our perspective today. You know, for example, you know, we already put tattoos on our bodies and pierce ourselves, but the idea of um, hormone treatments to you know, experience a different uh, uh, different sexual desires or to slightly modify the body um, in temporary ways. I think, um, I think this is a right around the corner. And, and I'm not, uh, I, I think it's, it's a great opening up of discussion, like who should control these things. Like as it is now, um, one must obtain lots of approvals and have a lot of interfaces with medical professionals before before doing anything that's um, that's lasting, but that might change with the rise of do-it-yourself biology and how sort of accessible a lot of these technologies are. Okay, great, thanks. I think uh, we are a bit late, so I think that we can go ahead with the second part of the lecture, and then at the end we have another question time, okay? Okay. Sorry, just a moment. Okay. 
So as a way to help to frame some of the projects that are to come, it's useful to take a quick look at how there is this phenomenon of the dropping price of synthesizing and sequencing genetic information. Um, this has happened very fast in the last few years, and it interestingly mirrors how this happened with the price of steel in the late 19th century, and how uh, it happened with the price of computing power in the late 20th century. And of course, those both led to revolutions, the industrial and digital. So if we're in the midst of a biotechnical revolution, this is one of the, the building blocks of it, how it's manifesting. So there's uh, a project like uh, ZOA that comes from Modern Meadow. This is a prototype that was commissioned by the Museum of Modern Art and um, displayed as part of their uh, fashion items show. And this is a kind of leather on the shirt that is made by way of genetically modified yeasts. And these produce collagen um, along with, as they normally do, um, CO2 and, and alcohol. And this collagen is the uh, it's a substance that's a, the, the basis of all leather. And we all have it in our, um, in our skin and around our organs. Um, and this, when made in a laboratory in such a way, if it could be scaled up, could have a huge um, value for replacing the kind of traditional method, of course, of creating leather from animal hides. It also frees up some of the kind of aesthetic limitations that normally accompany having animal skins in terms of how when the collagen is made, it's in this liquid form and then can be made into shapes and given textures and other properties that would otherwise not be possible. Another project that uses um, very new biotechnology is Resurrecting the Sublime by Daisy Ginsberg and her collaborators at Ginkgo Bioworks and Harvard University. And for this project, um, they found an extinct species of flower. And then with some genetic material from a sample in the, um, in the collections of Harvard University, they were able to predict with some high degree of confidence what kinds of compounds would be made by this flower that had, that had an odor. And then synthesize and produce enough of that to make an immersive installation where you could enter these chambers and smell uh, what a dis extinct flower would smell like. And this, I think, in a very interesting way, was misread or maybe a bit misunderstood by some people as a kind of optimistic view of like, we can bring back woolly mammoths or, or other kinds of um, extinct animals and species of plants. Whereas I kind of see it as a critical look at how we're fixated on the wrong things, that we have all of this you know, bountiful you know, ecologies and numerous species all around us that are going extinct so quickly. And yet what we do, what we have, what we're building, our values bring us to a place where we're resurrecting rather than preserving. And to help frame the next few projects, I think it's, it's a great thought experiment to look back on the first biotechnology, the Neolithic revolution, the moment when humans started to take seeds and plant them in places where nothing was growing or other things flourished and to see what would happen and eventually they domesticated crops. Around the time this was happening 10,000 years ago was also a moment of geological shift where a miniature ice age was coming to an end. And at that moment, or in the years around this time, the geological scales, there was a dramatic sea level rise, which flooded areas, including the what's today the Persian Gulf. And it's theorized by, um, by scientists, um, and there are links to some more information on this on my, uh, on my website, that at this moment, people may have interpreted this rising sea level as punishment for violating God's will, for taking nature and bending it into their own hands. And perhaps this is the basis for the, the myth of Eden and um, being cast from paradise, original sin, um, Prometheus giving fire to man. There's, there's so many interpretations or possible ways that that series of coincidences and the invention of biotechnology led to 
um, all of these kind of legacy beliefs and systems that we still carry with us today. And that's, I think, an interesting way to also think of an art project that has just been completed in the last year by Charlotte Jarvis. She's created the first female sperm by way of converting some of her own adult cells into stem cells, then propagating those into sex cells, and then altering those using the technology CRISPR-Cas9 into cells that are um, genetically male so that they could produce a spermazoa. Um, and then to complete the creation of sperm and semen, she took donations from numerous women to make a collective sort of act of creation, which of course sort of works in conflict with and as a sort of critique of the very long history of the in the arts and um, in sort of the popular imagination, the male potency being considered the most sort of creative and important and uh, powerful force. And next, I, I pause for a moment to recognize that in our webinar that was last week and in the question and answers that have already been posed um, prior to this talk, a lot of interesting questions have been brought up around creativity, um, ethics, and also um, machine learning and artificial intelligence. And I think these animating questions um, are really a good are good to explore in the context of talking about nature and tech. In that, you know, what is more more natural? What is more human than than creativity? Right? Is it is it that which sets us apart from every other kind of um, species? And if we can create something, if we create machines that can arguably be creative, what does that mean for humans? How we think of ourselves? and the legacy of, of humanity and civilization. As a case study, it was, I believe it was three and a half years ago, um, a collaboration took place between Microsoft, um, the Rijksmuseum here in Amsterdam, um, and a number of other experts in the field of preservation and art history to create a series of computer algorithms that could make an image that appeared as if it was painted by Rembrandt. This was based on the kind of visual history of all of Rembrandt's work. And then this image on, that you see on the right-hand side was 3D printed to have some of the textures and the lighting effects, all those, all those kind of great complex um, aspects of a real painting by Rembrandt. And then in order to sort of stage discussion about this to try to like make an, an argument about what what this means and, and if if a machine can churn out an infinite number of new rembrandt looking paintings what does that say about the value of the originals what does it say about um art history and what does it say about machines and working with them who's the credit who could, who could be credited here for um their creative work and so in order to to try to get this conversation in motion I found a painter in the town of Dafen named Pan Fubin. Dafen is a is a town in China where much of the population is involved in the work of copying old master paintings. And we gave him this image made by the machine and asked him to make a real oil painting from it by hand. So we had that commissioned, we brought it into the gallery, and it was a great centerpiece for some of these conversations about what was more more artistic? Was it the work of someone that spent hundreds of hours in front of a canvas, or was it the machine, or was it Rembrandt, or was it the countless collaborators that were involved in one way or another in the project? Switching mediums a bit, this is a, a poem that was algorithmically generated um, by a system that was designed by Ross Goodwin, an artist and technologist who has made a number of projects that are about exploring how creative machines can be and training them beforehand on um, the history of literature, poetry, to see what kind of interesting connections and observations or, or aesthetic qualities of writing can be made by these systems that don't really involve a human hand in them. 
And then finally, in the idea that the machines might put us all out of work, there's a really interesting series of experiments that are hosted by Google on their art experiments site. Um, it's found at this URL. Among them is this tool that allows you to pick the endpoints of a series of images that are generated based on their uh, sort of archive of works of sculpture and 2D visual art, paintings, um, a whole series of creative content. And you see these formal links between them in a series. It's a kind of a curatorial exercise, but that is done entirely by a machine that knows nothing about the context or the stories of any of these objects, but can just generate again and again these like aesthetically matching series of, of really fascinating examples. So I'd like to leave time, of course, for us to discuss these many topics that I think are touched on by way of these projects. And I thank you for your time, attention, and I encourage you to dig deeper, to look um, at the, the list of references and the links, um, books, projects, and people that are listed at the URL um, at the bottom of this slide here. Thank you very much. It's me again, hello. <laughs> I'm happy to in draw your attention on some live sketching going on that are curated by amazing Marcello Petruzzi. I think they are going to show this live sketching in a second. In drawing, we remain as a souvenir that we continuously bring back these amazing ideas that William has just explored for us. And uh, is Marcello's coming? Maybe not. Well, yes, coming. You see? <laughs> Amazing. Uh, well, have you had a, a, a sketching, a live sketching, William? <laughs> this is pretty new. <laughs> it looks like you, <laughs> honestly. And then yeah. as you can see is uh, well, a kind of um, uh, a, a sum up, a visual sum up of what we have just explored with William. And I guess that Nicola uh, has something new coming from the Slido community to share with us. Yeah, actually we are getting a lot of feedback. Um, the main issues that are uh, being discussed are the complicated relationships between science and politics. Also the issues of uh, individual mobility, the future of architecture or the use of data art in live events. We are also launching now a, a live poll on um, AI generated artworks. And uh, we have just asked uh, who should be considered the author in, uh, in AI generated artwork. As you can see, they are uh, uh, both the algorithms and the programmer are uh, winning, but uh, the programmer who created the algorithms too is uh, very close. And um, what do you think about this issue of the authorship of uh, when we have AI generated artworks? Uh, do you think that we can consider an algorithm, a machine learning software as a, an author or not, William? I, I don't think so. So I, I count myself as a kind of creativity conservative in the sense that I think the human imprint, the, the human like fingerprint must be somehow legible in the, in the output that the creative act is, is based in having human experience of having, having a body and having a, a, you know, a childhood and having a breathing the air. Like I, without, if you took, if you take that away, I feel like the meaning of, any creative act is, is lost. Okay. Um, another topic that uh, people are um, discussing about is uh, nature and, um, and also the topic of uh, digital intimacy. Um, in a post-pandemic world where we need to mediate social distancing with the cohabitation with the virus, how can we create a better sense of uh, digital intimacy with uh, other people, but also with uh, nature? So one thing that comes immediately to mind is the, the, the series of, of articles and opinion pieces that have been about how Zoom and Skype and all these platforms that we're using are really exhausting and they're, 
they're not conducive to a lot of connectivity. And, and I think perhaps it's worth exploring the step backwards, still using digital technology perhaps, but not so much in this kind of visual format, but instead maybe returning more to, to phone calls where you, where you feel like you're actually sitting right next to the other person and you have like more of a affinity and more of a closeness. Okay, and um, see, in the meanwhile, we are getting uh, other uh, replies on uh, Slido, and uh, here, for example, we have the word cloud with uh, where the people are following us from. We have a lot of Milano, obviously, but we have also a lot of uh, from the rest of the world. Uh, by the way, what's happening on social media, on the multi-stream, Lorenza? Well, it's happening a lot. I have a lot of questions from Facebook, and the Facebook page says, well, uh, William, you know, they are very interested in your education. They would like to know uh, what's your background, what's your studies, and then they would like to know more about the interaction design for you, the future of interaction design. And these two questions are from Salvatore Di Monte and Ilaria Donofrio. Okay, so just uh, very quickly, my, my background, I'm you can see on LinkedIn is, um, had studied art history and business. And then um, about 10 years after that, I went to graduate school for uh, the history of design and writing. And that led to uh, the curatorial work and study of experiments in trying to make design more sustainable by way of working with biology. In terms of interaction design, I think that what, what how I hope, and I hope fully see the future uh, emerging in which interaction design becomes a lot more human focused in the sense that how, how we mentally react to news streams and likes and things are taken into account as we, we redesign some of these platforms that are just like, they give way to really low quality content and unsatisfying interactions and alienation. In fact, I would, I would go as far as to say that I think for interaction design, especially in digital platforms, there ought to emerge uh, a kind of new ergonomics that's about how our minds work and how, our, how we socially relate to each other through these systems. Just like we have ergonomics for how to make a couch or a chair or a fork, it should be the case with um, with these other interfaces that we're on all the time, of course. Sure. And uh, well, let, let me ask you another question that is all mine. As you know, tonight, this lecture is part of the MEETS activities as a regional SART center, as to say a member of the European network of organization promoted by the European Commission to disseminate the connection and cross fertilization of science, technology, and arts. Do you think that, well, let's say the public opinion is as a good feeling on this merging. Uh, well, I'm talking about the post-pandemic, you know, mood all over the world. I do. I think there's there's a pretty wide spread recognition that the the arts have a lot to offer in terms of the the harder sciences or like the more um, technical and scientific pursuits. But I also see there there is a, there are potential problems with that. For example, it seems to me that a lot of the the effort to try to pull in artists or creative practice into technological advancement or scientific work is in order to help those practitioners think about innovation. Like we have this kind of cult of innovation, this cult of like making the next digital thing or the next. Um, yeah, the next gadget or, or whatever object-based solution or best-selling thing um, one can make. Whereas it's the creative work and the outlook, the approach is not really being valued for its intrinsic qualities. So I see that being problematic, but at the same time, I'm, I have to be hopeful. And I think you know, anytime you can, you can create platforms, and maybe this is one, where people who identify with, with either of those those kind of ends of the spectrum are together reading about each other's work and relating in some way that helps them. 
Sure, sure. And well, we have a lot to talk about. And that, that's the reason why we are working hard to get you in Milan in the fall, as you know, and uh, Nicola will be with us too. And I hope all the Slido community as well, our, let's say, very, very energetic community live too. So uh, let me quickly sum up saying that we, we, we are looking forward to hearing some new uh, thoughts and ideas from our community. They can share all on our website, that is meetcenter.it. And uh, William, I would like to thank you very much. And if, feel free to, well, if you want, say something to, well, say goodbye <laughs> to our, you know, uh, contributors and all the community that are watching and listening to us. Sure, sure. First, let me say thanks to you and your team. And I, I feel like there's there's still questions coming up. I'm going to in the next, uh, yeah. right, at, right after this, I'll get back on. <laughs> I'll get back onto the platform and start writing answers and see if I can engage more people. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, and, yeah, I, questions, yeah. and I I look forward to being in person with um, as many of you as possible <laughs> later this year. Yeah, we hope so. <laughs> thank you, William. And thank you to all the team, amazing team. We cannot name them, but thank you guys. Thank you all. Ciao, see you soon. Ciao. Bye. Ciao, ciao.